this is a continuation of my previous video. I first read Marx's Capital by myself as a first year undergrad economist. Later, in my third year, I helped organise a student study group and we read the three volumes collectively. Even after reading it twice, I had confusions about the difference between the terms value and exchange value. Confusions which many, many initial readers of Capital share. In 1973, I went for a PhD interview with Atar Hussein. He'd recently published an English translation of Marx's Notes on Wagner. And that's significant because that is the last text that Marx wrote that deals with value and is taken by many to be his final thoughts on the topic. Listening to um, Attar, I realised I had fundamentally misunderstood things. I gave my presentation on my proposed research, which was going to be on unproductive labour, and he explained that I really didn't yet understand the difference between Marx's usage of value and exchange value and he spent some time explaining to me what the the real meaning was needless to say i didn't get to be his phd students many marxists still share the sophomoric confusion that i had at that point so what do marxists mean by value there's a bunch of terms that marxist economists use relating to this they use the term use value, exchange value, value form, value substance, labour value, value itself, price. Now, how do these terms relate to one another? Which ones mean the same thing and which ones mean different things? Which are subsets and which are supersets of one another? And I'll, I'm going to explain in this video what I understand them to mean and I'm closely following the explanation that Professor Hussein gave me it's now almost half a century ago. So let's look at the source. The utility of a thing makes it a use value but this utility is not a thing of air being limited by the physical properties of the commodity, it has no existence apart from the commodity. A commodity such as iron, corn or a diamond is therefore, so far as it is a material thing, a use value, something useful. It's a fairly simple definition, but there are some possible confusions. The most common confusion an initial reader makes is to confuse this with utility in orthodox economics. But you should note that it's a quite distinct concept from subjective utility used by marginalists in econo econo economics. Because it, from Marx's standpoint, a use value is a property of the material object. It's an objective property of the object that it can be put to certain uses. And he says it has no existence apart from that commodity. It doesn't exist in the minds of people looking at the commodity. On exchange value, he says, exchange value at first sight presents itself as a quantitative relation, as the proportion in which values in use of one sort are exchanged for those of another sort, a relation constantly changing with time and place. Now, Take note of this point about constantly changing with time and place. He's saying it's something that changes all the time. It's not something intrinsic. Exchange value appears to be something accidental and purely relative. Consequently, an intrinsic value, i.e. an exchange value that is inseparably connected with and inherent in commodities, seems a contradiction in terms. Now, this is a point. 
by exchange value marks mean the same thing as form value. First, the valid exchange values of a given commodity express something equal. Secondly, exchange value is generally only the mode of expression, the phenomenal form of something contained in it yet distinguishable from it. It is a phenomenal form exchange value. Marx here is using the distinction which comes from Aristotle between form and substance. The form is distinct from what it expresses. What the form expresses, in the case of commodities, is the value substance. And of this he says, as values, all commodities are only definite masses of congealed labour time. We see then that which determines the magnitude of the value of any article is the amount of labour time socially necessary or the labour time socially necessary for its production. This is the famous labour theory of value. That labour is the substance of value and the magnitude of the labour used determines the magnitude of value. Now we come on to price. The elementary expression of the relative value of a single commodity such as linen in terms of the commodity such as gold that plays the part of money is the price form of that commodity. The price form of linen is therefore 20 yards of linen equals 2 ounces of gold or if 2 ounces of gold when coined are 2 pounds 20 yards of linen equals two pounds. So price is a developed form of exchange value. In Marx's day, coins were gold. So that when you purchase something with gold sovereigns, what happened was there was an exchange ratio between gold as a commodity and the thing you were purchasing. Nowadays, it's an exchange ratio with a fiat money, so it becomes more abstract. Important point is that price isn't value and value isn't the value form. Just as this ultimate money form of the world of commodities, sorry, it is, sorry, I missed that word. It is just this ultimate form of the world of commodities that conceals instead of disclosing the social character of private labour and the social relations between individual producers. As the measure of value, it serves to convert the values of all the manifold commodities into prices, into imaginary quantities of gold. As the standard of price, it measures those quantities of gold. By the standard of price, he means the number of or fraction of an ounce of gold that is contained in a one pound sovereign coin. Price depends not only on the value of a commodity, but therefore also on the value of money. And this is an important property of price, which makes it non-conformant with value. For example, before COVID, you could easily buy butter in the UK for well under two pounds. Uh, checking on what the price of butter was yesterday, the best deal I could get was two pound thirty. Now has butter suddenly become more valuable? Or has money become less valuable? Money becoming less valuable means that one pound represents fewer minutes of labour. And that is just something which affects all commodities that, is, that are being purchased with pounds. But relative prices also change a lot. On the right, there is a graph of gas prices, wholesale gas prices, the spot gas price that gas 
uh, selling companies, companies that sell gas to the final consumer, purchase it from gas producing companies. And you can see it undergoes huge variations. Uh, the scale of the variations are astonishing. Here we have, in for a brief period, in looks like July, the price fell to about five pence a therm. By um, say the end of September, it was over five pounds a therm. That's a hundredfold variation over the course of a couple of months. So has the value of gas been changing? Or does exchange value misrepresent value? Well, clearly, the amount of labor required to produce gas was not jumping around from day to day. It didn't require a hundred times as much labor to produce gas in September as it did in July. Of this, Mark says, supply and demand regulate nothing but temporary fluctuations of market prices. Though explain why the market price of a commodity rises or shrinks below its value, but they can never account for that value itself. That is to say, you should not and should never mistake the exchange value of a commodity with its value. They're quite distinct things. Price, which is equal to exchange value, which is the value form, is quite distinct from value. And it's only over the long run that value set by the conditions of production regulates price. Day to day it doesn't. Day to day you're dominated by short term movements of supply and demand. And in the case of something like gas, it is literally supply and demand. It, the supply is the gas flowing down the pipelines from the North Sea. The demand is the amount of gas that is being burnt at that moment. Now, adding this up, what we've come to is that value and exchange value are conceptually dis distinct. Exchange value can change without value changing. Value itself is a property of the conditions of social production and only changes when production conditions change. And value is prior to, therefore, and independent of commodity exchange. It doesn't depend on sale or commodity exchange. So does value exist in post-capitalist society? From the definition of value, it's obviously it does. Now, let's look at it formally, in mass terms. Whichever way you're using the word, value is a relation. Exchange value is a relation between two commodities, the ratio in which they are currently exchanging at this moment. Value itself, on the other hand, is a relation between a use value and the technical conditions under which society produces it. And it's important not to confuse these two relations. Confusing those two relations is at the root of a lot of misunderstanding. And confusion can arise if, when you read Marx, you fail to distinguish between when he talks of value and when he talks of value form. They're two different things. The former means labour and the latter means price. Now, both values and prices induce vector spaces of the same dimension. Values are a vector space of dimension n, where n is the number of commodities. If there are n commodities, there are n distinct commodity values. And prices are also a vector space of dimension n. If there are n commodities, there are n distinct prices. At a deep formal level, though, there are quite distinct 
causal reasons why these two vector spaces arise. The vector space of exchange values arises from the properties of a market where arbitrage means that mutually consistent exchange ratios have to emerge. When you have n commodities, you in principle have a matrix of n squared different pairwise exchange ratios. But if they're to be mutually consistent, this is only possible if there is a single price for every commodity. And hence a price vector necessarily emerges. Otherwise there would be arbitrage trading. This arbitrage trading becomes most obvious when you have a market for different currencies. An international currency market. The vector space of labour values, on the other hand, arises from the properties of production. And in Marxist economics, we represent this by two things. With what we call a technology matrix A, which is an N by N matrix, where element AIJ is the amount of use value I used to produce one unit of use value J. This is a formal mathematical way of describing the conditions of production. In addition to that, in Marxist economics, we say there is a vector lambda of labour in inputs, where lambda i is the amount of labour used directly to produce one unit of use value i. Those are the two formal properties of the uh, formal descriptions of the conditions of production. And it can be shown that this results in a unique vector of total labour contents associating a labour value with each use value. Um, the, the original source for showing that clearly was Marishima's Marxist mathematical treatment of Mar Marxist economics. And note, the determination of value in no way depends on commodity exchange or private property. The technology matrix is a matrix relating types of use values. It's not relating monetary values, not relating exchange values. Now, what happens is that the price vector gets captured by the value vector. We know it's formally possible for the value space to be represented in the price space because they're vectors of the same dimension. Formally speaking, what we would call a homomorphism is possible. An exact homomorphism exists under the assumptions that Marx makes in volume 1 and 2 of Capital, where prices are assumed to be linearly proportional to values, in which case you have an exact homomorphism. In volume two of Capital, he demonstrates that if this homomorphism holds, then capitalist economy is capable of self-reproduction. So capitalist reproduction allows the space of prices to be captured by the space of labor contents. How does this happen? Well, the value space encodes reproduction constraints that the economy has. And it feeds into the way reproduction can occur. The back arrow on the reproduction here indicates the um, fact that means of production are fed back into production. Current prices feed into this to the extent that reproduction fails under the current prices, prices change. So the price space is driven by the reproduction process. And this induces an enforced homomorphism, an approximate hom homomorphism, between the value space, which derives from the technical conditions of production, and the price space, which arises from the reproduction of those technical conditions of production under capitalist property relations. But 
why is labor special here? Why do we single out labor? One, human labor is necessary in every industry. Two, human labor is polymorphous or abstract. People can be trained up for any trade. It's therefore a universal resource from the standpoint of the economy. Thirdly, every pop the population of every nation is finite and people can only work part of the day. So labor acts as the ultimate constraint on the structure of social production. The relation between value and exchange value is a projection relation. The projection is affected by private property relations. The important point though is because of the dynamics of capitalist economy, the space of value vectors has a one-to-many projections onto the space of price vectors. We saw that in the case of wholesale gas prices. The value wasn't changing but the price changes from day to day. There's a whole batch of prices which are being represented noisily or which are noisily representing the values. In terms of communication theory it's what we would call a noisy channel. What's being transmitted is not what emerges at the end as prices. So the source of the signal is labour time, labour value. It feeds through private property relations and that acts as a noisy channel which gives an inaccurate projection onto the form assumed by value, the value form, exchange value, which is strictly speaking a superset of prices to the extent that any non-monetary um, bartering takes place. Now, touch on the politics of these questions. Value form school, which is rose to prominence after the fall of East Germany. And the confusion between value and exchange value reaches its, really reaches its maximum in this school. Their argument is that value is inseparable from the value form. And hence it's sale that validates value. Now this is quite contrary to the Marxist position and it can easily slip over into concessions to the Austrian school who similarly emphasise the role of markets in determining valuation. Now it's been a long lasting controversy. Here we have Stalin saying that the operation of the law of value is not confined to the sphere of commodity circulation. It also extends to production. True, the law of value has no regulating function in our socialist production, but it nevertheless influences production and this fact cannot be ignored when directing production. What does he mean by this? Unless production engineers know the labour requirements of the inputs they use, it's impossible for them to rationally select inputs that are economical for society as a whole. Stalin's book on the economic problems of socialism is one long lament about the practical mess you can get into if you think you can simply abolish the law of value. Now, what is the causal chain in the two cases? What drives it are changes in technology, development of the productive forces in other words, or changes in environmental conditions. For example, the relative exhaustion of the Baku oil fields necessitating the development of the Siberian oil fields. This changes the labour necessary to make things. Now, if you're in a capitalist economy, this changes the long-run average exchange values or market prices. If you're in a communist economy, 
it changes partly the labor values at which consumer goods are distributed. But it also should change the relative social labor costs published to production engineers of the different inputs to production. And as I said, a lot of Stalin's book complains about the fact that the guide prices set for engineers in the USSR in the 1950s were far too diverged from accurate calculations of values to allow rational planning to take place. So the same thing the law of value produces its effects under different social forms. It produces different effects. And to operate properly, any communist economy has to take it into account. Otherwise, you get irrational waste of resources. <laughs>